Hello, Craig Graves and everybody out there in the land. How are you, Craig? Hey, man. It's a good day in the neighborhood. I know. Look, man. The Look over at the wall. Do you see the wall over there? Ah, it's beautifully dripping down the wall. How cool is that? Do you see, man? Something wrong with you, dude. That can, yeah, no. I'm That's the just... worst tripping impression I've ever heard in my whole life. I'm trying, man. I'm really, really trying. I'm doing new openings uh, as our topics are. We will be talking about psycho pharma or what is it called? Psycho psychedelic treatment. God, now I'm messing my thing my, myself up with MDMA and esketamine. Ketamine, man, we've been wanting to do this show for a long time, haven't we, Craig? Yeah, I think it's gonna be fun. You're I'm really gonna, to it. I yeah. know you're gonna enjoy the crap out of this one, and I've I've had I've had people talking about it forever. I don't know what took me so long. I've I've had this gentleman uh, who's gonna join us tonight, you know, on my desk forever, and I finally got it done. So welcome. I am Chris Gazdick. He is Craig Graves. I am a mental health and substance abuse therapist, and he is an unbeatable mind coach. I have the book out, Re-Understanding Emotions and Becoming Your Best Self. Pretty excited about that. The paper version to be out in March, mid, I think, what, March 16th. And Craig, you are available to everyone in the nation and the world right now, helping you out with coaching services. You can find them at winyourmind.com, spelled as it sounds. Pretty neat stuff that he's been starting to do with people. See the world through the lens of a therapist and a coach. Be aware this is not the delivery of therapy services in any way. Check out throughatherapistseyes.com where our producer Neil has been doing some cool stuff on there. If you've been listening to the show, you know what's there. You can get full show transcriptions and the books that we talk about and different things. So, Mr. Graves, this is the human emotional experience. I propose that we figure this thing out together, man. Let's do it. And I just want to let you know that I have the inside track. In that book you've been talking about, I actually <laughs> happen to be holding a physical copy of it. Yeah, that was signed really, too. How about that? Really cool to give that to you, man. I just, man. I just got my first. Uh, is this the first copy you've given out? It is not. What? I'm sorry. Hey, I can't believe you gave somebody one before me, dude. DW was right in in, in okay, my book. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. I'm number two then. No, you're number ah. one, two, three, four, five. Jeez, dude. Five. I should have been number two, man. No, Lisa, Aaron, and Adam. I got my first four uh, okay, copies, right. and I gave I'll them to them. Yeah, yeah, thank you for yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> it is really cool to give people that, though. And uh, you know, Yeah, it's it, neat. And I, I think I mentioned last show I've been reading it. It's actually good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's actually really good. You say that like you're surprised. Well, no, I mean, but, it, but it's good. It's, it's a great, <laughs> it's, 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 it's easy to read. It's not very technical. You know, the, the layperson could read it, which is good, which is good in my opinion. And uh, man, God bless Courtney Donaldson, man. Oh, she helped me out a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and, and who is and who is Courtney? <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Courtney's the editor, but it's good. I'm, I'm happy for you, bro. Vosem.com to find Courtney, man. She rocks. So listen, you know, on this show, we uh, we definitely try to cover current events a little bit as well. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, and I'm definitely not going to go down a bunny hole of political conversations and whatnot. But if you've listened to the last couple of shows, we had already recorded them prior to all of the, man, all of the crazy events, you know, in our nation, in our nation's capital on January the 6th, Wednesday. I think what I want to use in this platform that we've developed for Through Therapist Eyes listeners is just to, to deal with the current events and the emotions of the matter. You know, everyone has their political views, and that's fine. Everyone really needs to have a voice, needs to be able to have their ability to appropriately express themselves and whatnot. I just want to kind of use this platform to kind of talk about, ironically, what we talked about. The when did Hope, 2020 Hope Created released? Didn't did it not release like the day after? I, I, I can't remember now. I think I, I want to say it did. It might have been. And and how apropos and fitting for that, man. Yeah. We, we did not plan that, but I was very happy because if you didn't listen to that show, we talked about how Hope is created and how actually 2020, the crazy year that it's been. You have an internal locus of control to create hope with your feelings and emotions. And I know that a lot of people are struggling out there and have a lot of hurt and have a lot of struggle. I mean, dang, man, I feel it too because it's been a tough, tough week, to say the least, in, our, in my own thoughts. And so I know it affects people. I, I want to I call for calm. <laughs> you know, I want to I call for an internal calm, you know, having the ability to, as the serenity prayer says control the things that you control right the courage change the things that you can 
And boy, that wisdom to know the difference is pretty daggum important, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> it definitely is. You know, so and and actually, just as a side note, we've talked about social media before as well. I'll refer you to our prior shows and just leave it at that, because I think that we have a lot of pre-sided wisdom to that that we've talked about. And clearly, Mr. Graves needs to talk about more for sure. Would you agree? Yes. Right. Any thoughts there before we move on, or things you're thinking, man? No. No, that could be a whole rabbit hole. Yeah, it can. Okay, so I think I hope I did a good job with that. And uh, really, let's, let's pray, think, meditate, use a mantra on uh, some calm for everything that we're going through. So, Craig, we got a really cool dude that I have had, as I said, sitting on my list. He had a talk that I intended to go to. I think it was speaking of the pandemic right around the time the pandemic started, right? He gave a talk about his, his treatments that he does with esketamine. And I just didn't get my, my stuff together, I was busy or whatever, and, and didn't get to the to the presentation that I did intend to go to. But we have Dr. Craig Chepke with us. He is from Excel Psychiatric Associates there in Huntersville. More on that in a second. But he has a special interest in mo- movement disorders, neuropsychiatric conditions, and treatment, a resistant mental illness. He employs the entire spectrum of pharmacological interventions from older, underutilized treatments to new leading-edge medications to find the right solution for his patients. He strongly emphasized psychotherapy, which is awesome. Did you hear this, by the way, Craig? He strongly emphasized psychotherapeutic interventions. That's therapy. That's why I had to pause there. Psychiatry is people not referring to therapy when they do medications. Consider the source of a therapist, but got to say I love that part. And he encourages physical health through wellness, through exercise, dietary modification, and supplementation. You like that, don't you, Craig? Absolutely. <laughs> Figured you would. He's active in clinical trial research and serves on the board of directors of a nonprofit organization benefiting schizophrenia and Huntington's disease. So from his website, Mr. Dr. Craig Chepke is a board-certified psychiatrist and has been named as a fellow on the, of the American Psychiatric Association. He attends uh, NYU School of Medicine. I won't tell you about WVU, sir, but we'll talk about that later. And completed his residency training at, oh God, do I have to say that? You go ahead and say that. It's hard for me to say too. I can't do it. But I will say it at Duke University. Dear. In addition to his clinical practice, Dr. Chepke is an adjunct professor, uh, an adjunct assistant professor, I should say, of psychiatry at the University of North Carolina School of Medicine. Doctor, welcome to the Through a Therapist Eyes show. How'd I do with that? That was fantastic. Thanks so much for that introduction. I hope my mom listens to this. <laughs> right. So can I ask the first question? Absolutely, man. So that University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill? Yes, sir. So how do you, how are you a Blue Devil and a Tar Heel? I didn't even pick that up. <laughs> <laughs> That's jacked up right there. <laughs> well, you know, my friends from high school have all asked the same question. And so basically, you know, I really wanted to be a Duke professor, but I wasn't smart enough. And Chapel Hill would take about anybody. So that's kind of how that landed. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I want to edit that part out. <laughs> <laughs> well, the good thing is that gets a laugh from both Duke and Carolina fans. So yeah. It's a win-win. A good, yeah, safe, a, a good safe deal. You're used to that, I guess. Yeah, that was exactly. Good. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Where are you from? What makes you you? And tell us a little bit more sort of just about you know just about you what do you like to do anything you want to want the people to know that says this is who I am well so I grew up in the Charlotte area and um, I, I live very close to my family family is incredibly important to me that's one thing that I've taken as a blessing from the pandemic is that you know we have to turn in internally to family and we got to spend a lot of good time together so yeah I, I grew up around here and I'm happy to be practicing in the Charlotte area and I truly love teaching. And so I consider myself to be an educator who just also happens to practice medicine. And, you know, I'm very fortunate to be able to work with a, a lot of people who n- need help. So that's kind of what makes me tick. I, I enjoy helping people, being a service and uh, learning and educating. Awesome. Yeah, that's cool. Craig, we've gotten away from doing our fun facts, you know, as far as, you know, people getting to know us and all that kind of thing. So let me ask you a, a question that is important question, pointed question. Learned it actually from my supervisor uh, years ago. We had staffings, and every week we'd sit there and we'd huddle for our staffings, and he'd sit there and ask us, "What'd you do for fun this weekend? What'd you do for fun every week? Every week, what'd you do for fun?" But it was a point, you know, to take care of yourself and everything. Mm-hmm. He he taught us that. So I always think of Jeff when I when I when I pose that question. But what kind of things you do for fun? Well, so most recently, my my oldest son, who just turned 11 last week, he got a pretty massive Lego set as a, a gift from uh, nice. my cousin. 
And so the, he and then his younger brother and I have been putting it together. I have one more uh, child, a daughter, but she just turned five. So we're, we're keeping her out of the, the Lego building business. But that's the project we've been working on as a family, and we've been really enjoying that. How cool. many toes have you broken? Oh, I've, I've stepped on so many. Yeah. I mean, I basically got hobbit feet at this point from all the Legos I've stepped on. Oh, that's rough. I bet. That's, that comes from having a 16-year-old and a 19-year-old mm-hmm. and just remembering those days with everything all over the place. Yeah, I saw a, a, a satire recently. It said, new, they, they, new Lego kills you immediately so you don't feel the pain. Of, <laughs> oh, that would be nice. On the thing. <laughs> nice. So I, I got a question for you. So if you, you grew up in the Charlotte area, how did you end up at in, in New York for school? Well, so I've just, uh, a couple of times in my life, I've just felt really called to be in a certain place. First one was at, at Duke for college. And then I just felt something calling me up to New York City that I felt like that was going to be where I needed to have the next uh, part of the chapter of my life. And I actually ended up there the first week of medical school was September 11th. And so I was really? there for the September 11th, wow. 2001 attacks. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so that was a really. That was the very first day you were up there? The first week, yeah. First uh, week? I got there you know, about a week maybe or so So before. were you in Manhattan when this, you could see <laughs> yeah. the towers and everything? Yeah, yeah. And wow. NYU in Lower Midtown, Manhattan is where wow. NYU Medical School is located. And Welcome to New York, young man. Yeah. <laughs> How did that affect school? Was, I guess school was probably not in session for some period of time actually the, the opposite it, it continued days, we yeah. just had maybe three, three days i think it happened i believe yeah. it was a tuesday and we actually had our first anatomy exam that that friday wow. <laughs> i think something like 80 percent of the class failed it and <laughs> uh, obviously because no one was thinking about that but yeah, yeah. It, it was pretty humbling and you know that day all of us first year med students put on our scrubs and went to the bellevue emergency room to try wow. and help and I think every off-duty doctor in, in New York City showed up, and so they just said, hey, kids, uh, you're in our way. Get out of here. Wow. You know, go donate some blood if you want to help. But the line to donate blood was so long, they said, we're, we're not even going to be able to take you today to come back tomorrow. And you know, there, there was, at that time, even without the internet uh, being as prevalent, there was a lot of misinformation. People saying things like, there are guys with Uzis on Fifth Avenue. Now the Washington Monument got hit by a plane. And I basically just went to my dorm room and hid under the bed and cried, uh, honestly. My room kind of overlooked the Empire State Building. And so I had a plane hit that. Shrapnel could have flown through my window. And, you know, I was in fear for my life the entire day. But what kind of a turn is that? That's, yeah, that's a heck of an experience to try. To, I mean, because, you know, when you're transitioning and you're going to school for mm-hmm. the first time, and that might have been the first time you really left North Carolina really to live. And, yeah, it was. Oh, that must have been. How long did that weigh in your brain and just the, the trauma of it and all? Well, I'll let you know when you it's know? done. Um, <laughs> right. I mean, it's, it's, it's definitely something that, you know, that's obviously a, a half joke, but it is something that, you know, I think I'll always carry with me that, that, that feeling of powerlessness and, but similarly, the desire to help that, like I said, we put, we put on our scrubs and the first thing we want to do is try and help people. And, yeah. you know, in a in disaster, you have to stand tall and, and stand up for your, your fellow Americans and do your part to help. Well, you know, in that regard, I, I thank you. I know we talked on the phone and you've stayed open to serve mental health well through the pandemic and, and you know, in, in, in different ways. I think you're doing a lot more virtual and whatnot, but I appreciate your service and, and your, your, you know, people like to tout health cares and front response people. I mean, I'm looking at one. So thank hmm. you. My pleasure. You know. So where do we go? Let me see. Well, actually, I wanted to ask too. Like, what is your your presentation history? Where where have you spoken? You you kind of said you've done some studies and uh, some cl- clinical trials and some different things. Like, what, what have you what have you done in around this this area of esketamine treatment that we're talking about? Well, so I was actually was not a part of the esketamine st- clinical trial program, but. Yeah, I've, I've actually done a fair amount of speaking on the escatamine from in partnering with the company that manufactures it, Janssen Pharmaceuticals. Mm-hmm. So I've delivered educational programs to other healthcare providers over the past couple of years. And then also just on my own, there's some some resources on Facebook. Actually, some good things can come out of Facebook. There's a... Psychi- Hold on, let's pause right there. Is that possible? <laughs> Believe it or not, yes, yes it is. I There's know. a a, a, group, a closed group for psychiatrists that I answer questions about it on there, and then there's actually even a a full psychedelic psychiatry group on there for practitioners who do practice a psychedelic psychiatry with s ketamine and then other psychedelics as well. Yeah, I've got a support group, if you will, you know, with the Charlotte therapist group. So there there are there are very good things that come out of social media for sure. I know it's getting a real bad name these days, but. Yeah, and I've connected with um, Morgan James authors, and, and there's, there's a lot of good information out there that you can tap into. It just depends on what you do with it. But yeah, so I, I, I'll tell you, the, and I warned you on the phone. 
I, I warned you on the phone. So, Craig, I, I think I told you as well when we were kind of processing the show a little bit. I'm going to be honest with the audience, you know, on, on two fronts. You know, more, more than once we've done a show, and I'm, I'm kind of real honest about what I know, what I don't know, what I understand, what I don't understand, and I don't understand anything about this topic. Or I'm probably not doing myself service, by it, but I understand kind of some of the concepts, and, and, and it'll, be, it'll be cool to see what I've gotten out of kind of on the fringe of what this psychedelic, this whole psychedelic treatment thing is. But point number A, point letter A, point number one, which one should I go with there? <laughs> I don't know, man. You're probably going to change it on the next one anyway. Chris is like, A, 2, C. <laughs> so, no, the point, first point is really, like, I'm going to be learning. On this episode, man, I'm going to probably listen to it a couple of times and, uh, and really learn a lot along with you guys listening. Which, by the way, I think I saw in, when I was researching you a little bit, sir, you do, you, you've done a lot with sleep study and whatnot. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, sleep medicine, I think, is incredibly important to, to any psychiatrist practice. You know, I, one thing I say a lot is that sleep is the foundation of mental health. Without a good foundation, your whole house is going to crumble. Right. So, you know, I ask every patient about their sleep and, and really focus on that because that uh, really worsens every aspect of mental health. Well, I would really ask you actually to listen to, to the show we did with Dr. Stafford earlier, probably somewhere around midstream. Neil would be here. We'd be able to know which one, but he's not mad at him for that. Mr. Producer is not with us, but that's okay. In the mid of our shows, we did a part one and part two with him on the neurology and all of the stuff. He's a sleep doctor. He did it all his career. So maybe we'll have you back on, actually, because I, I, I don't find too many people that can speak in depth about such an important thing. And I, too, I agree. It's one of the basis of physical health, which affects mental health tremendously. So point number Roman numeral two, Greg. Roman numeral point number two is, ready? Dude, I'm a skeptic. I'm a skeptic. I don't know much about this. I'm, I'm excited to, to talk with you because, and I think you reacted on the phone when I told you, like, well, of course you are. <laughs> you know, of course you didn't, didn't phase you at all. Because I, I imagine you come across that a lot. I mean, is that so? Am I the norm or am I the, the abnorm when it comes to skepticalism of esketamine treatment? No, I, I, when, I think it's good to be a skeptic with really any, any information that you consume. That was one of the, the best things I learned in my medical training was that it, if, if you have a theory, you got to try and find every hole in it, every flaw in it. And, and then if, you, if it comes through tested through the fire, then you can really trust and rely on it. So you know, I think it's, it's healthy to be skeptical in, in this situation. But, and that certainly is, a, I think, a very common belief in terms of psychedelics. Yeah, and you know, I think that it's probably, I guess I'm wondering what kind of barrier you have with that or you've come across that because, I mean, you know, look, I don't mind saying I've been doing mental health, you know, therapy in some form or another for 20, 25 plus years. And I ain't never referred anybody to this ever. I mean, that's, I, I don't know, talking to you, I'm a little embarrassed to say that, but I, I haven't. And I wonder, I wonder how many people have, you know, I mean, where are we at with this? I mean, it is brand new. I mean, it's, I think, I think I saw the FDA just approved this like a year ago or something. I mean, it's, so it's like stupid new. But what do you come across with that insofar as clinicians and fellow colleagues and that type of thing? Just what's your experience with that? Sure. So, uh, yeah, esketamine was actually approved by the FDA in March of 2019. So it's coming yeah. up on two years just about. But even before that, the use of ketamine for treatment-resistant depression traces back about 20 years or so ago when it was first kind of discovered that low-dose, a sub-anesthetic doses of ketamine, ketamine began life and is still used as an anesthetic agent in uh, veterinary purposes and for adults. But at, at low doses below that, which would cause anesthesia, then it was discovered that in some small studies and anecdotal observations, it can be helpful for treatment-resistant depression. And treatment-resistant depression is defined as people who have tried two different traditional antidepressants and not had a clinical response from them, which is virtually 100% of the patients that I see by the time they make it to my office. If they respond to the first or second antidepressant, that's usually given by the primary care provider. So it's actually a very large percentage of patients with depression. And so, but it took a number of years for to get the clinical studies done and have the scientific rigor to prove that it was safe and prove that it was efficacious to the FDA's extraordinarily high bar. And so it's really only hit the mainstream, certainly uh, no earlier than a couple years ago. There have been ketamine clinics, though. The traditional ketamine, the S-ketamine, is a slightly different offtake of it. We can 
dive into that more if you want to, how it's a little bit different. But th those existed for a number of years. But, you know, I was, to be quite honest, just too skeptical of it to even refer patients to that myself before <laughs> escatamine was FDA approved. All right. I feel so, a little better. <laughs> yeah. No, absolutely. Uh, because we want to make sure that, that the, the, the first oath of, in the Hippocratic Oath is to you first do no harm. And it, it takes a pretty high bar for me to, to feel comfortable prescribing something or recommending it to, to a patient of mine. And until the escatamine hit the FDA approval, it didn't hit my bar for, for safety and efficacy yet. So, gotcha. uh, so I'm, you I'm actually pretty new to that it. long then for... No, I was then. not involved with any sort of ketamine treatment per, providing prior to that. Yeah, in general, I, so I was a chemistry major in college and I really deeply love psychopharmacology and I usually will study meds and follow clinical trials for a couple of years before medications approved and I did do that with escatamine but it was all in preparation of you know hopefully hoping that it would get approved and being able to integrate it into my practice to help my patients who needed it all right Craig I'm going to cue you up he said this has been approved for like a year maybe 20 years ago or so people started I don't know tripping and looking at it that's what anecdotal evidence means or whatever Talk about the Charmins as far as the history of psychedelic and stuff goes. How long has this stuff been in use? Would you guess? 20 well, years? Well, I don't know about escatamine <laughs> itself, yeah, but I mean, yeah. like, psychedelics in general have been used as far back as history. And, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is for forever. Peyote trip. You know, and they weren't banned until the 1960s because of the hippie thing going on in the country. And that's when Congress out made psychedelic drugs illegal. And if any of that's wrong, no, please absolutely. Me. So that's actually, if we, uh, when I unpack it a little bit more, that's where I go back to as well is that, you know, since basically the dawn of human history, people have been using psychedelics, and there's got to be a reason for that. And as we, uh, actually, most, most of the history of psychopharmacology are things that were discovered anecdotally by serendipity. And then the science and the chemistry evolved, and they were synthetically modified and then synthetically created. But it all started off with seeing something that humans tended to use in in plants or or other sources similar to that out of nature, and then try and figure out well what is it about that 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 certain humans find appealing and beneficial in certain ways, and how can we harness that and replicate it in a safer way that we're able to standardize as a medicinal product. And you know, there's a there's an interesting differential that you just kind of stumbled on. I don't know if you meant it or not, but how, how did you just say it? Not left my brain beneficial versus pleasing. Is that what you said? Pleasing? What, what, what word did he say? You, you, because the difference is really, I mean, do we, do we take this because it's pleasing exactly. or do we take this because it's beneficial? It's beneficial. Right. Yeah, obviously right. for that, treatment, but not just because it feels good, but because it actually performs a useful uh, uh, service in the person's life and gives them something that they, they, that they need, but they aren't able to achieve in other ways. Because maybe this will come up in a little bit because sometimes it might not be very pleasing. <laughs> it's scary. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, it can be absolutely. It's these medications are a double-edged sword, and what what is pleasing to one person could be very distressing to another, and and some of it depends on the individual genetics, and then also just the, you know how is it administered? What what's the dosage? What's the purity? What's the standardization? You know, there's just so many variables that can affect someone's response to it, good or bad. So so what is esketamine? Sure. So ketamine itself is a mixture of two different components. There's S-ketamine and R-ketamine. And you can think of it chemically like the, a left-hand and a right-hand version. Now, those are both mirror images of each other. But if you've ever tried to put your right hand in a left-handed glove, then you know it doesn't quite fit. And so many medications historically have had that mixture of the left and the right-hand version, one of which is more active and beneficial in, in the body or the brain, and one of which is a little bit less useful, but happens to come along for the ride. It's sort of like H THC and CBD. It, it's a little bit different, actually. Those are two completely different molecules. Uh, the S ketamine and the R ketamine, they they literally like a mirror image that you'd see yourself in a mirror and everything is reversed. So you would think like, oh, well, you could just flip it around and it would be the same thing. Mm -hmm. But your left and your right hand, no matter how you flip them around, they'll never actually be completely the same. They'll just look very close. So again, one of them is more beneficial, one of them is less. And so the scientists have been able to purify out the less helpful part, the, in this case, the R-ketamine, and leave, leave it with just the pure S-ketamine. And that's hmm. the, the benefit of using it is that it, the, it, it, we believe is a little bit more suited to use as an antidepressant versus the R-ketamine. Just a little warning for the listening audience. 
I can tell. Should I call you Dr. Chepke or do you, do you, how should I refer to you, by the way? Well, we've got another Craig at the table, so uh, uh, Dr. Chepke might make yeah, you a little yeah, more clear. Keep it easy. Good point. Good point. <laughs> I was worried about that, That's too. That's a good idea. But for the listening audience, I can tell uh, Dr. Chepke that I am going to, I'm going to need to dumb a lot of this down. And so when I, my brain gets hurt, like I think it just started to hurt, I'll ask you and we'll make it. Holy <laughs> cow. <laughs> it's a lot harder without being able to use uh, visual aids. And it is. I, it, I do it really a lot of drawings is. and diagrams in my practice. I that agree. I just take out a sheet of paper and draw stuff. For people, well, you can so. draw for us. That'd be cool. I want to see and, and also for the listening audience, we we did decide uh, Dr. Chapke is going to be able to hang out with us for for a part one and a part two. So we're we're not going to be in a rush. We want to really get good information out to you. So that's uh, just so you know, we're we're really going to be um, diligent on that and not be rushed at all. So, so is is ketamine a natural substance? Is it? Well, but it, no, I don't believe that ketamine is uh, found in nature, that it was the process of a some sort of synthetic reaction. Uh, I believe it was derived from something found in nature, but taken several chemical steps beyond that. So you wouldn't be able to find a, you know, a plant or a berry that had uh, ketamine in it. Got it. Got it. And I guess we'll get into this maybe a little bit you know, a little bit more in depth later on. Craig, we might have to fight each other for questions. I think we're going to mm-hmm. fight for airtime. Yeah, no, I'm about to wrap your face with t- duct tape. Because there's so many <laughs> different, how do I want to even say that intelligently? I mean, you got MDMA, you've got, you know, esketamine, ketamine, you know, you've got different, mm-hmm. and I heard you mention it before, so we'll, we'll probably look at the different types and whatnot, but I don't know, like, how how many types are there, and what are we? What is the basics of what we're talking about when we talk about uh, psychedelic treatment? I mean, that's a bro- is that a broad stroke? Yeah, psychedelic yeah. treatments would be just kind of like an umbrella term for yeah. a, a number of different agents, and many of them are uh, used as drugs of abuse. So, ketamine has been known as Special K and has been a, 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 right. a club drug throughout the years. Wow, right. Um, but then the, the, some other psychedelics that are out there would be. LSD, psilocybin, MDMA, and really all of those are being looked at in clinical trials for different uh, psychiatric illnesses, whether it be depression or PTSD and, and other conditions. So it really, it's kind of, esketamine is the leading edge of, it's the first one that has been FDA approved in any way, shape, or form. And we're, scientists are looking to see, can we replicate that conceptually in terms of figuring out what can we take that is beneficial for people out of what has been used in, in an unregulated fashion for centuries or even millennia to try and make sure that we can give it in the right way that is, has the best ratio of being helpful with the least amount of side effects or harm. Right. You know, I was thinking about that before, and I'm glad it came back in my head because I think I will lose it if I don't go to it now. And, and it's, it, 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 my brain speaks partly to the culture of this, right? Like, I got to tell you, as a, you know, Craig was just surprised at the, the, the phrase special K. And that, that just triggered off into my head, like, yeah, I'm a substance abuse counselor. So, <laughs> like, when I first heard of this stuff several years ago, my brain starts screaming, what the hell are we doing? We're, we're going to take cocaine and treat mental health? We're going to take a drug that people get date raped on and, and, and treat depression? And, like, this is crazy. I mean, that was my initial mm-hmm. reaction. This is crazy, you know? And I think that we do have broader to that and the substance abuse professionals and stuff, you know, we've got a, the, you know, the American culture and, you know, histories of prohibition mm-hmm. and a, a real conflicted belief on like, hey, yeah, we do this, but we don't do this. Like killing things. We used to live on farms and it used to be a regular part of our life. I read a book named Colonel Grossman on killing. Well, we don't do that, but we know we have to. Sex. Yeah, we don't do that. But, you know, yeah, we do. You know, drugs and alcohol, well, we had prohibition. We don't do that, mm-hmm. right? Well, yeah, we do. So it's just, I'm just pointing out like this, this, this sort of cultural barrier in our entire culture to this. Does that make sense? Oh, absolutely. There's kind of a... a, a... A strange comparison between some of the holdovers of the kind of the puritanical beliefs uh, from early America to more forward-thinking ones, and yeah, Craig alluded to earlier there was the 
you know, the kind of following after the the reefer madness and there was a, the, the ban and the illegalization of most of these substances and that really put a halt to all the kind of clinical trial research even even academics couldn't study this stuff up right. until very recently some some laws had to be changed and uh, the, because of the strict regulations and anytime that you can't can't study something then you're always going to fear something you don't know more than something that you're able to to d- discover and examine and put through the fire and so you, as you said this is this is something that people still did and mm-hmm. there was no ability to study it with science and so myths and rumors uh, were the only things that were able to be unearthed by the the culture and and a lot of misrepresentations came about and so it's it can be kind of a scary thing Doctor, how do you think we started to come out of that thing? How do you think that, or or maybe there's a story? I don't know what it is, but but it was a banned substance, and it mm-hmm. was it was the devil, if you want to say that. Now we've got all this research behind what these these psychedelics might be able to do for us. John Hopkins has a has a research center. Why are we now coming out of that cycle of thinking, oh, these things are just bad. We should stay away from them completely. Well, I, there's probably a, a ton of different reasons. I, I think one large reason, though, is that. We're, we're kind of hitting a wall with pharmaceuticals in terms of the treatment of mental health conditions in, in terms of increasing efficacy. You know, the treatments, new treatments come out all the time, and mostly they're, in the past few decades, they're not really making significant advances in the efficacy of the medications, how effective they are to treat the illness, but they are making progress in the safety and tolerability. Well, that, that leaves a lot of people who might have, not have any side effects to medications, but they're not getting better either. And as a result, there's been, I think, kind of a groundswell of, well, we've got to do something. And there's some evidence here that this can help people that have not been helped by any of the traditional treatments that we do have FDA approved. So therefore, we, out of desperation, because people are sick and people are dying, you know, there's, there's so many crises in this country, the, 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 the COVID crisis, the opioid em- epidemic crisis, but the, you know, following shortly behind, I'd say we'd have to think about the, the suicide crisis. In fact, I lost my own uncle to suicide in August of 2020, just this mm. past year. Wow. So uh, this is something that we, we have to take on because people are dying every it's, day of this in real. this country and, and globally. It's real. That kind of, I had written this down earlier. Is like, how does the ketamine treatment work? So like with, well, let with, me jump in with, there, Craig. We're on the same page. I, I want what I want to do with that is first of all, listening on, and we have a basic article that you can find on the show notes. Man, I've been got articles on this stuff for last year or so. I probably should have had ten articles up, but there's a lot that you can find out there. What I want to do with that is, is perfect segue, Doctor. You just mentioned you know traditional medications, and I'm gonna. This is a little intimidating, though, Craig, because I got a doctor in the house, and I'm going to like <laughs> do my normal definition or description of what SSRIs do. So, what we understand, and this is what mm-hmm. I help my clients understand, with traditional medications, serotonin reuptake inhibitors, mm-hmm. you know, or SNRIs, serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, right? So, what what we're doing traditionally, as I've understood it, you correct me if I'm wrong, you know, if you think of brain chemistry, okay, you've got trillions of neurons. I mean, the brain is an amazing thing. So you get as many neurons in your brain as there are stars in the sky. If you think about that, that's crazy. That just blows my mind because I like astronomy and science classes on how, how uh, space works, you know. That many neurons in your brain. I mean, just think about that. It's crazy. Each neuron is talking to each other. It's like a, I like to think of it as an electronic, you know, through your brain. And so the neuron talks to each other by releasing these little itty bitty things. And, you know, Gwen Wilde talked about neurotransmitters on our show, if you remember, Craig, right? Mm-hmm. So this, this little itty bitty neuron releases these chemicals, serotonin, dopamine, norepinephrine, and then it floats it out into a synapse space, a synapse, to the other neuron, and it plugs in like a receptor. And so sometimes that system is kind of screwed up. It's not working quite so right. And for whatever reason, maybe we don't even fully really understand the nanotechnology of it, but we, we, we know that that's generally the way that it works. And so to help that system work better, well, back up, in the normal system, it floats it out in the synapse and it sucks it back in. It reuptakes into the neuron, right? The dopamine goes out there. It doesn't find a little hole to fit in. So the neuron will suck it back in. And so what we do with the typical treatments is we block that. So it just basically tries to flood the little synapse space there. So the neuron has a better chance of firing the next neuron. And it just zips through your brain that way with a bunch of little itty bitty chemicals. 
Does that sound kind of close to what we try to do with SSRIs and SNRIs? traditional antidepressants how how would i do there no that was fantastic and and that was actually a a really good foundation for me to build off of in terms of what makes esketamine different that's my question absolutely so (laughs) gotta know (laughs) so you mentioned the three most common neurotransmitters that we talk about in psychiatry serotonin dopamine and norepinephrine so collectively we call all three of those the monoamines so the monoamines that's all we've been doing in terms of depression for you know for decades, 30, 50 years, some, something like that, every treatment for depression has focused on one or, or a combination of those three neurotransmitters. So the problem with that is that actually out of all the, the neurons in the brain, only about 5% of them are monoamine uh, neuro, uh, uh, receptors or neurons. So that, okay, that's- Okay, wait a minute. Hold on. I'm, I'm, I'm learning here. And I'm a skeptic, remember. Mm-hmm. Say that again. Five five percent of our neurons in our brain, or what? what go, are ahead. the monoamines, either serotonin, dopamine, or norepinephrine? So ninety five percent of our neurons are doing something else. Exactly. Wow. Really? And we're focusing on those three. Right, and that's the that's the problem. Is what I think, and what many people think, is that we we have too narrow of a scope. That depression is incredibly heterogeneous. There, the current criteria for depression. There's actually 227 different combinations of symptoms that you can have and still qualify for the diagnosis of major depressive disorder. Right. And to think that we're going to help every single one of those types of depression by just by plugging up the reuptake of serotonin, well, you know, that's a little simplistic because it's more complicated than that. They're the two most wow. common answers I give are it's more complicated than that and it depends. And neither my wife nor my patients like those answers, but that's really just but, how but it, it is. is. And, and I hope I'm not taking us off track, but the, the listening audience, if they're regular listeners of our show, they will understand the, the neurology discussions that we've had. And I've been baffled at learning about that. So this is going to serve as a reminder for some of you listening, and some will be the first time that you heard it. To, to, to add to the complexity there, which applies to what you just said, dealing with the other neurons, we have learned on the show, and me in a training, where, Craig, you correct me if I'm wrong if you remember, because sometimes I screw up numbers in my, my brain. We have been found to have like 60 different neurotransmitters. Upon which Glenn Wild, I think, told us, we only have names for 20 of them, right? Because 40 of them are like so small, so whatever, that we can't measure them. We haven't even named them. So of the 60 neurotransmitters, we only have names for 20 of them, upon which, as we just said, the mononuclei or whatever he was talking about, we only deal with three of them, right? Exactly. It's complex. Absolutely. And you're exactly right. Many of them are just uh, found in such a small concentration. So most of the brain are, is made up of neurons that are one of two types. There is, uh, on one hand, glutamate. Glutamate is the major excitatory neurotransmitter of the brain, like the gas pedal. That makes up about 50 to 55% of neurons in the brain. And then the other half is our GABA neurons. GABA is like the brake pedal. It's the major inhibitory neurotransmitter of the brain. And that makes up 40 to 45% of the neurons in the brain. So if you add that up, 5% monoamines, 50 to 55% glutamate, and 40 to 45% GABA, well, that adds up to close to 100%. So all, all the other, you know, let's just use that number 60 and 50, say the remaining 55 neurotransmitters make up far less than even 1% of the brain. So it's really, the brain is composed of mostly GABA and glutamate, but we're only using the treatments that affect the, the, the serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine in treatment prior to two years ago. Yeah. And that'll make your head blow off, Craig. How you a lot. Doing? How you doing over there? I'm doing good. That is a lot, though. It's a lot to take in. It is. And, I, and, and I'll be honest with you, I'm following that probably about 65 70%, which is why I want to listen to this again, because you're, you're talking about neurons as well. Like, when did we begin to learn about, like, I'm shocked at only... Five, that 5% five thing just blows my head away. I did not ever hear that before. When did we start learning some of this about the glutamate neurons and the different neurons? I mean, neurotransmitters we've known for a little while. But when did we start learning about the different function of the neurons themselves and that breakdown that you just gave us? Well, you so know? the uh, in psychiatry, this is very new. In, uh, but in other fields of neuroscience, it's been well-known for a while. Epilepsy. 
the, the epilepsy yeah. treatments are predominantly you know, either dealing with glut- glutamate or GABA. So that's been uh, well known there, but we just haven't had any tools in psychiatry to And those be are able different to, neurotransmitters, to right? Yeah, those GABA, are the two yeah. that I mentioned, the, the, the major excitatory and major inhibitory ones. So other fields of, of brain science have been, have been fairly well versed on those two for decades. It's just that we haven't caught up yet. Psychiatry has been a little bit behind the curve, and esketamine is the first uh, licensed treatment to be able to modulate this system. Okay, so do we have any idea, going back to where we started this, woo, this ride, <laughs> I'm tripping, Craig. <laughs> I get it. Like, you got it, did you? Yeah, not literally. <laughs> <laughs> Although no, was, I'm sober right now. <laughs> that was better than the, the, the gag they did at the top of the show, though. That, that was more that, Oh, that was than, better? Yeah. That was, I did better? I'm yeah. getting, maybe, I'll, yeah, maybe I'll be really good by the end. <laughs> okay, so getting back to the beginning of this little ride we're on, uh, do, what do we know about the esketamine treatments then as different from the SSRIs as far as, you know, do we, do we know what they're doing to the other neurotransmitters and whatnot? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. We, we, well, theories, of course, and well, we don't really know how are... anything that the, in the brain works. What do you mean by that? Well, I mean, the, the body's unbelievably complicated, and the brain more so than anything else, in, in my opinion. You know, the, the, the kidneys, that's kind of like a glorified coffee filter. The, the heart, that's like a glorified pump. But the brain, as he mentioned, with you know, trillions of neurons that are interconnected uh, and interwoven in so many ways, mm-hmm. you know, we, we know very little comparatively about that. And you know, our, our brains are surrounded by that, that thick uh, bone called the skull. So it's hard to get in there. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's hard to figure out what's going on. And so, you know, we have to make a lot of theories based off animal models. And we do have some, some imaging, it's like functional MRIs and PET scans and things like that recently. But it's been much harder to crack the code of the brain than it has been other organs of the body. So, and, you know, we also have to say theories because we don't really know how anything in the universe works. You no. know, we, we have our human theories, but there's a, a, you know, something much greater behind it than one than what we're able to define, in my opinion. Okay, fair enough. So what is it? What is it known? Do we know much about what well, you say we do? We yes. Know, yeah. So esketamine is a antagonist or a blocker of this certain receptor called the NMDA receptor. Now, that is a type of, of glutamate receptor. So esketamine does work on the glutamate system. So it it is able to tap into modulating that system that controls about 50 to 55% of the brain. So that's that's why we believe that it's able to help people that are not able to be helped by the traditional mono means, the serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine medications. As a blocker. So similar to what I described in my knowledge of SSRIs, are we saying that esketamine acts as a blocker in much the same way to the reuptake? Well, so, uh, you know, it depends on how complicated we want to get. So yeah. <laughs> it, it depends on are, are you blocking a, are you blocking the gas pedal? Or are you blocking the brake pedal? So <sighs> as ketamine kind of blocks you from your body from pressing on the brakes. So if you, if you block the brake pedal, then you're going to go faster, right? Okay. So that's, that's what as ketamine does is that it lifts the foot up off the gas pedal, so to speak, or I'm sorry, it lifts your foot up off the brake pedal. And then that's why it, we believe that it helps depression. Because it helps the brain to go more, go faster, so to speak, in, in very simplistic terms. Another way, more specifically, that it helps is you mentioned the synapses, the connections between neurons, because they don't exist in a vacuum. They talk to each other. So we believe that people with depression have an impaired ability to generate those synapses. And so those connections, they get old, they get rusty, they get maladaptive cognitive pathways, and they, people with depression can't break out of them. So as ketamine, by what it does, it actually helps the brain to form new synapses and to clear away the old ones. So we call that neuroplasticity, that the plasticity means the ability to remodel itself. So as ketamine is able to help the brain become more plastic and more remoldable, such that it can break down the bad uh, cognitive pathways and generate new healthier ones. Craig, I'm developing a lot of questions and I see your <laughs> pen working. We got to take a break. Can you believe that? But we got two shows. How about we take a real quick break and we'll come back. Okay. This is a break for our sponsor of BetterHelp Counseling Services. And Craig, I'm feeling like I might need some better help right now. How are you feeling? <laughs> I'm feeling pretty good. This is cool. <laughs> it's really cool. I know, right? We are in the middle of our show on psychedelics treatment, but please don't forget about the website through a therapist's eyes where you can click the counseling tab. And that's going to take you to a quick little survey where they figure out what specific th- Sort of therapeutic needs you want, 
and BetterHelp will uh, link you up with a particular therapist right from your own home where you can engage in teletherapy or video conferencing therapy. So BetterHelp is a wonderful service that I've actually gotten on board with in the last seven months from the pandemic start. Prior to that, I might not have, but it is great now. So check it out. We get a uh, uh, an offer of promotion and support from BetterHelp. If you go to Through a Therapist Size, click the Counseling tab, bump over to the survey, and you will get hooked up with an awesome therapist. All right, we're going to get back to the show. So yeah, Craig, what do you, I'm gonna I'm gonna let you go because I I don't I, I've got a lot of thoughts about things. Unless you are you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Yeah. I think I got I got a couple questions I had written down. So if we get SSRIs, we get a prescription. We got to keep, mm-hmm. keep getting it refilled. Does does mm-hmm. does ketamine work similar to that, or do you go in one treatment and you're good to go? How does how does the how does that process work? So that that's an excellent question. So there there are some differences. So one thing is that esketamine is not a pill. It is a intranasal treatment that you you inhale th- uh, through your nose, uh, kind of like you would like Afrin or something like that. And so you, it has to be done also in a healthcare provider's setting. You, you don't take this home because it is a highly controlled substance. There, there are a lot of safe, safety checks involved to make sure that it does not get misused. So it comes from a specialty pharmacy directly to the healthcare provider's office who has to store it securely. The patient comes to the healthcare provider's office and then they administer to themselves like they would Afrin or some similar nasal spray. And then they have to stay at the healthcare provider's office for two hours to monitor for potential side effects and make sure that they're safe before they're able to go home. So. This treatment happens in, in the first month two times per week. And then after that first month, it drops down to once weekly. And then after that, then there's a little bit of flexibility. You can, the person can either, depending on their response, continue with once weekly treatments, or they might be able to drop down to less frequent treatments, maybe every other week. And, and then as time goes on, uh, even further, potentially, uh, depending on how well they're able to do and how long they individually can go between treatments. Interesting. So it is quite a bit different. So let me let me just recap. So it's a nasal treatment in a controlled environment, about two hours. Yes. Uh, the first month you do twice a week. After that, you do once a week. Mm-hmm. And then after that, it could gradually go. Could Correct. Gradually. Now, during that two-hour period, is that person experiencing a psychedelic kind of mind-altering state? Is that... We so, talked about psychedelic experiences before we turned the mics on. Is it is it similar to that kind of thing, or or how does how does it work? So it it can be for for most people. Well, most people will have some dissociation is the particular side effect we we would call it for esketamine, and up to maybe seventy percent of people can have some level of dissociation. Now, for most people in with the esketamine treatments, it's dissociation mm-hmm. or hallucination. Dissociation, not hallucination. D- Def- big difference. A, a huge difference, yeah. Not, it's not a psychosis phenomenon that hallucination would be. It is very different. Hallucinations are a, a perception that does not actually exist in reality. So that can be a visual hallucination, an auditory hallucination, or any of the five senses can have a uh, the person believes that they're experiencing it, but it actually does not have a basis in reality. Dissociation is, is different. The most extreme example, but probably the most familiar to people, would be an out-of-body experience. That, wow. That's what that's kind of the, the highest level of dissociation. But then at lower levels, then it's just instead of a uh, perception that does not exist, it's just a kind of a distortion of actual perception. So some common ones that I've seen in my practice are distortions of time. People think that time is passing faster than, than it actually is or slower than it actually is. Or it could be things like size, color, uh, things like that. I have some acoustical tiles in uh, the ceiling of my office, and one patient early on with esketamine said, were, were those always multicolored? I thought they used to be just black dots up there. But they, were, they, they, they were at that time and remain black dots, but she was perceiving that and have some color. So, you know, some other ways to describe it, you know, with the change in, in time would be maybe something that you, know, you here might have experienced yourself. You know, if you've ever uh, played sports and maybe basketball and, you know, the, the rim looks like it's the, as wide as a, as a hockey net, you know, you're in the zone or you're with someone that you love deeply and you feel like just minutes have passed, but you've actually been with them hours. Things like that can occur with, without any sort of any external psychedelic treatment. I describe dissociation to help people understand it because we all experience dissociated states. 
simply driving down the road, mm-hmm. you think you're driving to the work and you actually intended to drive to the grocery store and sure. you find yourself like you missed a turn. That's actually a disassociated state. When you're doing a sketamine treatment, is it sometimes as bland and simple as that? Or is it is that a little bit too no, too simple? It, it is sometimes it just very boring that you know, in medicine, like, it being boring is, is not a bad thing. Right. I'd rather be boring than, than overly exciting. Interesting. Yeah. So some people actually, uh, a lot of people will just giggle uncontrollably for you know maybe 45 minutes that's that's when the escadamine peaks in the body and then de- declines in the bloodstream after that so they'll just laugh giggling at yeah. you right well, yeah, I got probably <laughs> <laughs> i wouldn't blame them you know earlier you i think i think i heard you say earlier correct me if i'm wrong but you become eligible for escadamine after you've had two other medications that didn't work is that that i that i hear yes, that right that is correct it sounds like there's some really cool benefits to this. I mean, you're tapping into the 55% of the mm-hmm. brain. You're making the brain more plastic, mm-hmm. clearing out the old synap- synop- synapses. synapses, synapses and, and creating new ones. Why wouldn't you just skip those other things and go straight to this? Well, so you know, some, some <laughs> psychiatrists would probably advocate for that, but it is, it is a very serious treatment. So we mentioned dissociation is one of the common side effects, and there are some others too. One is sedation. So it can, it's used as an anesthetic in higher doses. So it can be very sedating. So much so that part of the uh, protocol that allows us to prescribe it is that patients can't drive home that day. So after they've received the treatment, they need to have someone else drive them home, whether that's a friend, family member, could be an Uber, um, whatever it might be. But it's, it's been shown that people are not safe to drive that day. So that's one drawback. And then also it does increase blood pressure too. So usually it's a fairly small or negligible increase, but some percentage of people can have a fairly significant increase. So we do, as part of the workup for determining who's eligible for esketamine, look at have they had any aneurysms or any, any strokes or any other significant cardiac history that could place them at risk for an increased blood pressure causing them harm. And then, of course, there's the fact that it's a highly controlled substance and it can be misused, abused, and people can become dependent on it. So th- those are probably, the, I'd say, the, the main reasons why we wouldn't jump straight to that. But, you know, in all honesty, a lot of my patients have told me they feel that esketamine has fewer side effects than many of the traditional antidepressants that they've taken in the past. Wow. Now, you mentioned efficacy earlier. Mm -hmm. How How do the two compare that way, SSRIs versus esketamine? Is there a way to do that? Do we really know? Well, so no, there's not been any head-to-head studies looking yeah. at just simply esketamine versus an SSRI, and actually, or any antidepressant act for that matter. And the the way that esketamine was studied, and therefore the way that the FDA recommends it, it used, is that it is in conjunction with a an, another anti oral antidepressant medication. So they do combine. Is that yes, the that's, that's the way it was studied. Most of the, the traditional ketamine providers prior to esketamine have done it in monotherapy without any traditional antidepressants. And in terms of physiology, I think that's reasonable. But the, the way that it's been studied and proved in fashion is in combination with a oral antidepressant. Yeah, and I think that, you know, Craig, you, you got to think about, to answer your question too, Craig, you know, you, you know Dr. Chapke, he, I mean, he prescribes Prozac. He, he prescribes Luvox. He, he, he prescribes, you know, Welbutrin and, you know, these, these medications, correct? I mean, you, you know, you, oh, yeah. you work Absolutely. with all these medications and we know them, you know, so, you know, the, the reality of it is you're going to go with what you know. I mean, I, I, I can't believe we haven't had somebody talking about regular pharmacology treatment and mental health on the show yet. I, it's just my failure. I, I've been waiting on our, our, our current friend of mine. I told you on the phone who I'm talking about. She said she's coming on. You know, we'll see what's up. We know that SSRIs are effective. I mean, we, we know that they benefit people. I, I, I say to all my folks in, in therapy, Dr. J.P., that, you know, I, I see medications as being a tool to manage mental health, mm-hmm. not a solution. And I'd be willing to say, S-ketamine isn't going to be a solution either. It's not going to solve the brain's complicated Absolutely. process with depression. It's just, it's, I heard you say absolutely. Like, it's just not. So we're going to go with what we know first and then add what might be really beneficial with this. For, I mean, does that sound fair? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And then also the, the thing that I left out is that you have to come to the healthcare provider's office twice a week at first and then once a week. And it's pretty cumbersome, you know, as opposed to just a, uh, a bottle of pills that you pick up at your local pharmacy and then you take in the comfort of your own home. 
and you're able to drive and work and things like that afterwards. So, so that, that's another factor in terms of why we wouldn't go with that first. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. And uh, real quick, I, we, good good spot to get some of the simple things in. And when we come back for part two, I got I got I got a good way to start us out back with the complicated stuff: money, cash. How's that work? So, uh, you know, probably yet another reason. So, uh, newer treatments are when they are uh, brand named are are always going to be more expensive than generic medications, which uh, most uh, of the traditional oral antidepressants are generic now. There are a couple branded ones. So the cost of the medication to insurers is relatively high. The coverage the, that insurances have had for esketamine has improved pretty dramatically over the, pa- the past two years. Initially, it was extremely difficult to get insurance to cover it. It's recently gotten a lot better, specifically in the past uh, six months or so. Does any insurance cover this? Oh, yeah. Really? Yeah. And Who? actually, well, I mean, it, it, it depends on the plans because there's a, a, yeah. a thousand I, different Blue Crosses, that's a, a thousand holes, different Etras, <laughs> a, a, a thousand different Uniteds. But Blue Cross of North Carolina actually got significantly better coverage in the past six months to where it went from being the one that was basically a non-starter uh, in terms of insurances to now one that's actually fairly easy in most cases for me to get it approved for my patients. So you're telling me insurance companies have a CPT code that you can bill an insurance company for us getting me treatment yes wow okay okay that's shocking what the codes are, are for monitoring that ha- that existed prior to esketamine because there are other treatments uh, you know chemotherapies or something where there has to be a prolonged monitoring of a of a of a patient receiving medication in a healthcare setting so those codes that existed prior to esketamine and just they they can be used for esketamine same as they would for dialysis or chemotherapy or is that because it's been approved by the fda now Has yes approved that? Exactly. So that, wow that's what that that's does. the differentiator oh, is that wow. insurances will not pay for right. any of the Unapproved. of the old ketamine that is used off label because it's not oh. fda approved okay. but the fda approval from esketamine makes it fall under a basically a medical necessity that it can be argued that it is medically necessary because it is rigorously studied fda approved etc you got thoughts? Yeah. No, no, no. Just... no. Yeah, that's 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 awesome. I'm 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 really encouraged to hear that because I mean, honestly, like you say, I mean, for a lot of my clients that are in therapy with me, this is a non-starter. You know, I mean, I don't have, I don't have, you know, three hundred dollars every two weeks to go sniff this stuff and see if it does any has any benefit. That's basically what I would get, right? So. I'll, I'll look into that. That's fascinating. What about age? Age issues and efficacy: kids, adolescents, young adults, older adults. I mean, you know, what do we know about? Do we know about any of the effects on you know different age groups? Has that been looked at much yet? Yes. So as of right now, esketamine is only approved for people eighteen and older. In terms of older patients, then there were some geriatric studies that were done with people over sixty-five years old, and when they did the specific study in people only sixty-five and older then that actually did not separate out from placebo. So that, that study was a negative trial. But that doesn't mean that we can't use it, that it's not efficacious. I, I've used it in people over 65 and have had good results. Mm. And in terms of adolescents and children, though, yeah. they're, they're, the studies are being conducted currently of esketamine in younger patients. So we, we don't yet know the results. So we have, we have uh, nothing to base it on as of yet. Yeah, I'm, I'm really nervous about my 18, 19 year old kid coming in to get a sketamine treatment, kind of putting the foot on the brake or the gas or whatever in a brain that ain't even done developed yet. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, that, that's, what do you think about brain development as it relates to this? Do we, again, do we know? That would be something that would be very speculative. We really don't know. So, the, the, you know, our brains are developing at least until the age of 24, but it's in constant evolution. So that's a tough call. You know, we'll have to see how the studies turn out. Is it effective? Is it safe? You know, we, we, I'm, I'm going to be waiting for those clinical trials to come out. Is the FDA down with that, though, right now? 18 and up, you said? Is that what it's... Uh, 18 and older is the FDA approved, yeah. Anyone who's, uh, as long as they're 18 or above, then that's the approved age bracket. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm more of a natural health guy, you know, and I, and I think about kids who are underage drinking and stuff like that, smoking dope, whatever they're doing, and their brain's not mm-hmm. being developed yet. Yeah. So do we know what SSRIs do to the brain at an early age? I mean, is we're, anytime you question. take a drug, you're monkeying with the brain function, you know. So I, And we do treat kids, mm-hmm. sometimes very, very young, with... Oh, very serious yeah. Uh, yeah. troubles yeah, yeah. of course ADD, just, but and i don't mean that as a, as a i'm just curious absolutely if there's well, studies on that side 
Yeah, I mean, ultimately, everything in medicine comes down to risk and benefit. So if the if the child and adolescent has, is having tremendous impairments, and you know, adolescent suicide is uh, unfortunately not at all uncommon. And if if there's someone who that that, that a particular treatment could save their life. Then we kind of have to take a risk with the with the something that that we don't fully know understand the consequences long term with it, but because we'll never find out what's going to happen to them if if their if their life ends at that point. Yeah, understood. I would be terribly depressed, Craig, if we had to end this at the part one and we weren't able to talk anymore tonight. So thank goodness you're going to hang out with us for about three four more hours, right? You well, if, we're, if we're wrapping up, I do have a, que- a yeah. question I want to ask. This absolutely. How Let's... did you how did you get involved with this? How I mean, how did how did you get involved with ketamine? If that's the right kind of question to ask, how did you begin using it as a treatment? Well, so you know, as I mentioned, I I study medications before they come out, and the reason for that is because I've always got patients who have not had good responses to the current set of meds, and I'm always looking to the horizon to see that well, what what's coming next, so that way I can help those people who I haven't been able to help otherwise. And so I had been uh, reading about esketamine, and there were several patients who I thought would be fantastic candidates that they had been through. I mean, some of the, some of the patients that I've treated with esketamine have been on 15 antidepressants, wow. and none of them were uh, significantly efficacious, or they weren't able to tolerate the side effects of them. And then on top of the 15 antidepressants, multiple other medications, like certain antipsychotics, are FDA approved for depression, and then you know other treatments, and none of them really did anything. And so this was something that I thought, well, maybe we can finally help these people. Wow. And many of them were you know, kind of at the end of the rope. They, after having tried 10, 15, 20 different yeah, meds, you know, how can you process. keep hope? Yeah. You know, Chris, you mentioned earlier hope. And that's one of the, I think the most important thing that a physician can give a patient is not a prescription, but hope. And so this was something that I looked at as, you know, I can give some, some hope to my patients is that hold on. Specifically, there was one patient in particular who the, the thought that esketamine could get approved and she might be able to take it was really what kept her alive mm-hmm. because she was ready to, to end her life. And I told her, just wait. Uh, this was in 2018. I said, just wait. There is this new medication that if it gets approved early next year, it's completely different. It works on a different neurotransmitter that is involving a much larger percentage of the brain. Maybe it could help. I can't promise you anything, but you know, don't check out until you at least try this. All right. And that's, that's what kept her here. Wow. Pretty powerful. That's awesome. Yeah, what did you say? Powerful. You don't, you, 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 you said you don't, you look for hope. What, what was that exact word you said? Oh, what I said was that the most important thing a physician can give a patient is not a prescription, but hope. That's, that's awesome. That's a great quote. I, I like that. And absolutely. Yeah. And, and that's where, you know, I have a pet peeve. I, I don't understand why any, any MD in a family practice or a gynecology office or, you know, certainly a psychiatrist office would, you know, be prescribing without pushing therapy. You know, yes. I mean, and really. furthermore, with esketamine in particular, I, I have uh, observed over the past two years that the patients who are active in psychotherapy have the best response to esketamine. Yeah. And my theory with that would be is that in therapy, you're looking to break down negative cognitions, build new, healthier ones. And for people who have impaired neuroplasticity, like I mentioned, that's more difficult. So with the esketamine treatment, they improve their neuroplasticity. And all of a sudden, the stuff that they have been beating their head up against the wall with in therapy starts to work. They start to change some of those uh, negative perceptions and negative cognitions that they previously were shackled to before. Okay, Man, sir. Awesome. Maybe, maybe we'll see, yeah. <laughs> all right craig you go ahead and I, your brain's buzzing and finish up and I'll, i'm going to take us out kind of with a question in a, in a specific no go ahead i you, think i'm i'm good you, for this good. well anything else you want to say in part one dr chapke that, that, that your brain's kind of thinking in sort of summary and whatnot well so the the last thing now i would say is that just how common it is for people to not have a good response to the traditional antidepressants there was a, the, one of the most important studies ever done in depression was done by the, the National Institute of Mental Health. It's called the STAR-D study. It was uh, done in the early 2000s, and it involved over 4,000 patients, the largest study of depression ever done. And they put everyone in step one on uh, a SSRI, and less than 50% of people had a response to that. And then after step one, then they were either switched to a different SSRI or uh, another medication like Wobutrin was added to the initial SSRI. And in that step, then it fell from a little under 50% of response down to about 38%. And then the third step, where they could add in some different of these traditional treatments, 
went down even further to about 18% people had a response, then 17% in step four. So there's just a massive drop off that, that, and that's how we got the definition of of treatment resistant depression is that there's not that much of a drop off between step one and step two. It's around like 15% or though. So, but then in terms of response rates from step two to step three, it drops by over 50%. So at, at, at the, after that second antidepressant, then it's like falling off a cliff. And so what I've always mm-hmm. felt is that as, mm-hmm. as healthcare providers, as, as physicians, that when our patient is standing at the edge of a cliff, we've got two choices. We can either reach out and pull them back in with a treatment that's going to be more effective, or we can effectively shove them off that cliff by giving them just another one of the same treatments that they didn't work on them the first time. Wow. Gotcha. Wow. Okay, let's 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 wrap it up. But I'm going to ask you a question. That I'm sorry, audience. I got to do a crazy tease, Craig. I'm going to ask a question, ask you not to answer it because we're going to start there in these complicated things and get our brains wired back up for serious depth of this in the, in part two. But before I ask the question, briefly here, what would you say? Right? What would you say to like fears people have? You know, I mean, listen, man, we we went from lobotomies where we're cutting holes in people's foreheads, we're digging around into the brain, and then we go to, like, ECT, we're shocking people, you know, we're zipping people with electricity, and that's supposed to help and whatever, so we go from lobotomies to shock treatment, which we still do, by the way, and has efficacy, I would say, but to this, so how do we, you know, then we're going to get high. I'll let you know about that in part two. (laughs) (laughs) All right, so a little teaser for part two is I am curious about the ECT treatment and the recidivism and whatnot. So what I mean by that is I'm curious, you know, if we have long-term knowledge, right, like ECT treatments, and you can correct me if I'm wrong later, but or in the next show, you know, we, we take things like ECT treatments, which are very effective for treatment-resistant depression as well, and then, you know, they get, boom, a great bit of help, and then it, it goes back down in relative quick time you're shaking your nodding your head a little bit yeah so we we know some of that so i'm really curious about uh, that and other deep involved things with what happens with this ketamine we're also going to talk a little bit about addiction and and some of the concerns side of all of this so stay tuned man i hope your brains aren't hurting i know this is Mm -hmm. deep stuff but it's really cool because dude this is cutting edge and we'll do more of a uh, thank you on the next part too but you're going to hang out with us right absolutely wouldn't leave all right so we're going to see you guys next week Thank you.